Father God, we come this morning. We just thank you for allowing us all to come into your house today and to worship together. Father, we're just going to ask you now to uh, continue to be with those that are sick. Father, continue to be with those that are struggling today. Father, we just ask you to touch their bodies and that you just help them today, Father. We just ask that you uh, continue to be with each of us and be with this service today and just have your way in this place. Guide us today and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
looking for the king, the new Messiah. We're following the star, shining brighter. If you can He shook his head But he pointed his hand There's a new kid in town And he's lying in a manger Down the road There's a new kid in town But he's just a their baby, I suppose. Heaven knows there's a new kid in town here in Bethlehem. Praise God. Travel far, bearing treasure. You say these gifts are for the new king's pleasure. I've heard that a king. I come, but up till now there hasn't been one. There's a new kid in town, and he's lying in the manger down the road. There's a new kid in There's a new kid in town Here in Bethlehem You won't know this kid You can do it today There's a new kid in town in town and he's lying in the manger down the road there's a new kid in town but he's just another baby I suppose heaven knows a new kid in town here in Stanford town. Praise God. Thank God for your son, Jesus Christ, today. Amen. Praise God. Exactly. you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water Mary did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters did you know that your baby boy has come to make us new This child that you delivered 
will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy could calm a stone with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again.
I'm afraid to be alone Sleeping far away from home I say a prayer and close my eyes I hope everything will be alright When the night has come and gone Mom and Dad will take me home just a little homesick I'm just, just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go I'm ready now to go back home Mom and Dad will come and take me home To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick I'm older now, it's plain to see This world's been so blessed to me Not a lot that makes me want to stay I'm making plans to move someday My Savior is who I want to see my family's there to welcome me Just a few more miles to go Until I make it home I'm just a little homesick I'm, I'm just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a plan called home That's where I really want to go My saving now to go back home My Savior's gonna take me home To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go I'm ready now to go back home My Savior comes and takes me home to the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick You're turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8 Imagine that. We're right back in Matthew chapter 8 where we started last week. And we're going to um, finish out this chapter this morning. And we're going to be looking at um, a, a little bit of different subject this morning. Uh, uh, if you paid attention to, some, uh, to our little thing up here, it says uh, tortured. And it's sort of our journey through Matthew, and we're going to talk about being tortured this morning. And it's not the kind of torture that you think. It's a, actually a complaint that a demon has against Jesus, and he's asking him not to torture him. But that's kind of where we're going to go this morning with this. But just to kind of um, um, bring us a little bit up to speed this morning, we're going to be looking at the subjects of deliverance and rejection. And we're um, looking at uh, Jesus' deliverance of two men from demon possession is, is what we're going to be actually looking at. And people 
get um, um, are kind of amazed by these uh, types of things that they read about in their Bible. And um, it is a pretty amazing story here, but it's, it's also a pretty significant one. It's so significant that it's not only mentioned here in Matthew, but it's also um, the whole story is laid out again in Mark chapter 5 and then over in Luke chapter 8 as well. And we're going to look at all three of those because um, when you, we look at uh, Matthew, and he kind of writes a summary of the events, and then uh, Mark and Luke, they add in some of the other details that kind of round out the story and, and kind of tell us uh, pretty much everything that went on during that. And, and if, if you've been here the last several weeks, we've been um, kind of following Jesus around as he's uh, been, been working through um, uh, Jerusalem and Galilee and, and Capernaum, everywhere he's going, we, he kind of, uh, Jesus is kind of working his way around him, and it seems like we've just been kind of following him, following him around as he went. Um, and we we lit, we um, witnessed several things as we've been looking in the Word about that Jesus has been doing. And um, and last week, uh, last Sunday morning, we looked at uh, something that was a little bit different. I call it kind of a Jesus was kind of thinning the herd a little bit is what he was doing. He was um, trying to determine who was really wanting to be a disciple and who was just kind of there um, just to play games a little bit with him. And, and we looked through that and we went through that whole process. And then we we finished up with Jesus and those um, those true disciples out on the lake there and the storm came up and the winds blew and they kind of freaked out a little bit and didn't know what was going on. They went and found Jesus. He was asleep. Imagine that. He didn't, he didn't have a worry in the world, but he was asleep. And they went and got him and woke him up and said, Oh, we're going to drown. And, of course, Jesus delivered them from that storm. And, it, and we kind of looked at how, um, how that storm um, it was more, more or less a metaphor for some of the storms that we have to go through too in, in our own lives and how, and how Jesus is that deliverance from there and from all those things. And this morning um, we're going to pick up on the other side of the lake there. They've taken the boat and they've reached the other side of the lake in a... Um, and and I, I have a hard time with this, but uh, pronouncing it. And it, they're in the region of the Gar. Got Gadarenes is the way. To, ugh. I always get my tongue tied. These uh, Greek and Hebrew words they just they, they drive me crazy sometimes. But but that's where they're at. They're on the other side of the lake, and uh, and we pick up here in Matthew chapter eight, um, verse twenty eight. So if you don't care if you're able to, I invite you to stand with me as we begin to read here. And, and again, that's Matthew chapter eight. I'm going to read verses twenty eight through thirty four, and it, it starts out this way. It says, when he arrived at the other side of the re of in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon possessed men coming from the coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. And it says, what do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And then some distance from them, a large herd of pigs were feeding. And the demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. And so they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. It says those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all of this, including what happened to the demon-possessed men. And then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Whew. Um. Pray with me this morning. Father, we come today and we thank you for our time of singing and of worship this morning. We ask you to continue to be with us, continue to help us, continue to open us up to receive your word today. Be with us and be with our families, and we thank you today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? But you can kind of look at it in several different ways. You kind of get a little tickled at it sometimes if you don't look at it in the right way. But right off the bat here, there's some things that happen. Um, you know, no sooner than Jesus and his disciples get off the boat, who's there to meet them? The devil. Satan and his demons and all of his evil forces are right there to meet him no sooner than they get off, 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 the, off the boat there. And they're there for one reason. That one reason is to cause trouble. It's to try to cause some type of division, try to cause some type of problem, try to hang Jesus up. And really, they're not going to do anything with him. But so what they're really after is they're after his disciples is what they're after. That's why, um, because um, we're going to get into it in a minute, but the devil knows that he can't do anything to Jesus. Jesus. 
And so he's going to try to get his disciples any way that he can. And that's really what, what we've got going on here is we've got all this, um, all this stuff that's been going on, all these things that's been transpiring. And then Jesus and his disciples reach the other side of the lake and this is what happens. It says, when they arrived on the other side, it says two demon-possessed men came from the tombs to meet him, from the graveyard. You all realize that the tombs in those days, what they did is they took a cave and, and they kind of cut out a place and they, and they put a bunch of dead people in that cave is basically what it was. Most of the time a family shared one. They had them all there together, but the tombs is where these people were living. And it says two demon-possessed men came out of the tombs to meet him. They were so violent that no one could pass their way. So these were some pretty bad dudes, weren't they? They were, they were the type of guy that, 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 when you saw, that when you saw them coming, you just kind of went the other way. So I'll go around this way or I'll, go, I'll take the next one or, or something like that. That's how they were. And, and um, you know, um, Mark and Luke, they focus on one of them in particular. Apparently he was worse than the other one. But this is what Mark says about it. It says, when they went across the lake to the region, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Just like in Matthew, it says, this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He was tough too, wasn't he? He was pretty strong. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't just mean, but he was tough. They tried to tie him up with chains and he would break free. It says, For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So not only was he strong, not only was he living in the graveyard, not only was he lonely, but he was also in torments. He was being tormented from within. He would cry out day and night, cut himself, all these things, because he was being tormented by these demon spirits. And then Luke adds this, uh, a um, nice little tidbit. He says, this is Luke eight twenty seven. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. So not only had he been living out in the tombs, he was naked. He was running around naked. He was a mess. They had kicked him completely out of town. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with him. These demons had drove him crazy, drove him to the point where he would do anything. He was running around naked, didn't have no clothes on. Nobody could contain him. Extremely strong. He was what we would probably call a menace to society. Really. He would be the one that we would try to avoid at all costs. Because if you saw him, you didn't know what he was going to do next. And nobody would probably blame us. You know, he's that private person that everybody's got in the back of their mind at one point in their life that absolutely just scared them plumb to death. Just absolutely terrified of them. That's kind of how he was. And here he comes towards Jesus. Coming out of the tomb, sees Jesus get off the boat and starts heading his way. Now, put yourself in Jesus' shoes. What would you have done? Hmm? Uh -uh. <laughs> Float, run, get on the boat, hide, get a big rock, something. Yeah. Try to get away whatever way we could, right? It's not what Jesus did though, was it? Jesus, he didn't walk away, he didn't run away, he didn't try to avoid him. He didn't try to act like he didn't see him and go the other direction. We do that, don't we? Even if it's somebody we just don't want to talk to. We see them coming. You know, we're, we're, we're riding our little shop and cart down Walmart. We, we start down that aisle, we see them. <laughs> oh, I need something down this aisle over here. <laughs> he didn't do none of that, did he? Absolutely none of it. He wasn't afraid to confront this man. He wasn't afraid to confront the demons that had possessed this man, the demons that had control over this guy. He wasn't a bit afraid of them. In fact, it was the other way around. Verse, uh, Matthew 8, 29 says, What do you want with us, Son of God? 
they shouted, Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And now Mark and Luke add a little bit more. They say, this is Mark uh, 5, 6. It says, When, when they, he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, look at this, and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. And then again in, in, in Luke it says, when, G, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torture me. This guy or the demons within him were absolutely terrified and scared to death of Jesus. And the reason they were terrified and scared to death was because they knew exactly who Jesus was. They referred to him by his title, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. They knew Jesus because guess what? They'd seen him before. They knew who he was. They knew what he was all about. They knew the power and the authority that Jesus had. They knew all of that. And they knew that in the end, guess what was going to happen to them? It wasn't going to be very good. It wasn't going to be very pleasant. They were going to be cast into the outer darkness, into the abyss, into the pits of hell, into the lake of fire. That was their destiny. And they knew that Jesus had the power to do that. And they were hoping that he would wait just a little bit longer. That's why he said, Oh, it's not the appointed time. It's not the right time. Just, just ease up a little bit. And here's this first point I want to make is that if Jesus Christ lives within you, if you are a child of God, you have that same authority. You have that same power. Satan or none of Satan's demons can do anything because you have the power of God. And they tremble and they flee at the sight or the sound or even the name of Jesus. And we need to stand up and take authority that God has given us over the evil that's in this world. But we do some things. We have a lot of people in this world. We have a lot of people in our community, maybe even in this church, that have a warped sense of what hell is really like. They've got a warped sense of what heaven and hell are like and what things are really like when we leave this world. And they have a warped sense of really who is in control and who has the power and the authority in this entire universe. And I've seen a lot of people say a lot of strange things. It happens a lot at funerals. They will say some strange things. They'll talk about, oh, oh yeah, when I get to hell we're just going to have a party. They'll say that kind of stuff. Or they'll talk about all the bad things that, oh, I've just restrained myself, but when I get there, I'm just going to go crazy, go wild. And I want to look at them and say, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? Because, just think about it this way, just for a minute. If these demons are absolutely scared to death of hell... Do you think it's going to be a party? Do you think that it's going to be fun? Do you think it's going to be a place where you can just do whatever you want? Don't sound very pleasant to me. And let's just think about it just for a minute too. Uh, Mr. Satan himself is trying everything he can to avoid it himself. And he knows what his destiny is, but he figures if he can't, if he can't avoid it, he's going to take as many people as he can with him. But he tries his best to avoid it. And people also have this warped sense that Satan has some type of authority in hell. Satan has no authority in hell because if he did, he wouldn't be going there. He wouldn't be confined there. He has no more authority than the poor soul next to him that's going to be in torments there as well. That's the company that you keep in hell. And nobody has authority over anybody. Everybody's in torments. Everybody's in flames. Here's what Jesus says about hell. Luke chapter 13 verse 28, he says, There will be weeping there, gnashing of teeth. He says, And when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself will be thrown out. Now, and this is his uh, parable here about Lazarus and the rich man. You all remember them? It says, uh, Luke 16, it says, In hell where he was in torment... He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now this is the rich man. This is the guy that had absolutely everything. 
He says, so he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue before I, because I am in agony in this fire. Y'all picture the tip of it. Look, here, here, there. It's all he was asking for. I can't even get it off there. Just one little drip because he was in such agony, such torments. And if you want a real good graphic picture of it, let's look at the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. It says, now these are the ones that are, that are, uh, that are Satan's top, I guess top dudes, if you want to call it that. Say, uh, Revelation 19, 20, but the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And then uh, chapter 20, verse 10, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. It says, where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then let's skip down to verse 11. Because people go, well, that's just the devil, and that's all his people. Well, here you go. Then I saw a great white throne, and him that was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If in, Listen to this verse right here. This is the most important verse of this whole passage. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Is your name written in the book of life this morning? If it's not, that's, that's where you're destined for, is the lake of fire. If your name is not written in God's book of life, that's, what, that's your destiny. I don't care how much good you've done. I don't care how happy you may seem right now, how you think you may be able to fool God. You ain't fooling nobody. If you haven't given your heart to Jesus, you're going to end up in the lake of fire. Plain and simple, that's what the Word of God says. I'm going to read you one more. This is Revelation 21.8. This gives you some characteristics of some folks there. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts or witchcraft, the idolaters and all liars... Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I hate to say it, but does any of that fit? If it does, you need to do something about it. Just plain and simple. I could probably stop right there, really. Because that's the most important thing. But do you see any parties mentioned there? Do you see anybody having a good time there? Anybody laughing and, and partying and, ha and playing and carrying on? Do you? Because it's not there. And we need to take it seriously. We need to take it seriously. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil will distract you. The devil will do things. The devil will use other people to distract you. Don't be distracted. Because I want to tell you something. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of his demons. I'm not afraid of anything that he's got to say or do. And if you're a child of God, you shouldn't be either. But also, if you're a child of God, you need to be taking a stand against those who are full of the devil. Because we have people in this world that are full of Satan. I've seen it. I can tell you stories that make your hair curl. And some of you probably, some others in here probably could too. It is real. 
It's not a joke. And I'm not playing this morning. And this demon scared absolutely to death because he thought that was what his destiny was going to be right then and there. So, Luke 8, 31, he says this, And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. That's hell. And I don't understand this part, to be honest with you. I don't know how all this works, but it is what it is, and it's what God's Word says. It says, Some distance from them a large herd of pigs were feeding. It says, The demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go! So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Think about that. Such a shock to those pigs. They ran off the cliff and died. Drowned themselves. Now now pigs are actually pretty smart animals. They're smart enough to know not to go jump off a cliff. But they did it anyway. Then backing up Mark 5, 9, we get some information about these demons. Jesus asked him, what's your name? He says, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And so Legion and all of his buddies are cast into a herd of pigs. I don't know how that works. I guess they have to go somewhere. When Jesus cast them out, they had to go somewhere, so... He gave them permission to go into a bunch of pigs. Wasted a bunch of bacon. And off into the, the lake they went. And we would have thought everybody would have just been, ooh, amazed. And they'd have been a great revival, people worshiping Jesus. Thinking, oh, I'm, I'm sure this guy... And he delivered. I mean, he was happy. It talks later on about him wanting to go with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, you've got to stay here. But he had been delivered. Do you know what it's like to be delivered? Think about when you were delivered, what it felt like. That's what this guy felt like. He had the weight of the world lifted off of him. But... It says, when those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. Most people would have written, told somebody. It says, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet. Look at this, dressed. This is Luke chapter 8, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that. It's uh, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They were afraid. I mean, this guy had tormented them, and now he's sitting at Jesus' feet, he's dressed in his right mind. But instead of rejoicing, it says they were afraid, scared. It says those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then our our scripture, uh, verse 34, Matthew 8, it says, Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. And then Luke 8, 37 says almost the same thing. It says, Then all the people of the region asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got, it says he got in the boat and left. Think about that. Why in the world were they so afraid? They were afraid because they knew they had their own demons. They knew they had their own sin. They knew that they had all these things in their own life. And if Jesus got a hold of it, then guess what? They were going to be confronted with the decision that they were going to have to make. They were either going to have to decide to let Jesus deal with those things and fall at his feet like this demon-possessed man or continue the way that they're going. That's what scared them. They chose just to do whatever they were already doing. They didn't want to do anything different. They didn't want to change. They didn't want to be delivered. So they said, oh, you just need to leave. He got in his boat and he left. How many times have you kicked Jesus out this morning? How many times have you asked him to leave? To get in the boat and leave? Think about it. What kind of demons do you have to deal with this morning? 
kind of sin do you have to deal with? Because the reality is, if you don't deal with it, you leave this world, you know all those scriptures I read from the book of Revelation? It's you. You might as well you put your name right in it. So if you don't deal with your sin, you leave no choice but God to judge you for it. So it ain't games. It's not funny. It's not fun. It's about what decision we're willing to make for God today. Because this is serious business. And I'll tell you, sometimes we end up getting distracted by other people around us because what happens is they don't want to take it seriously. And, we, and it kind of takes the heat off a little bit. Because they don't want to take it seriously. We think, well, they're not going to take it seriously, so I don't need to either. Well, I pray that nothing happens to you. probably every one of us in here can name somebody that's left this world just like that. And none of it mattered. The person next to you didn't matter. The jokes didn't matter. The conversations didn't matter. The ignoring the preacher didn't matter. What mattered was where your heart was with God. So this morning, where is it? I ask y'all to stand with me. Y'all care to come and sing? this morning I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond this morning I'm just going to ask you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you then you need to come deal with it it says plain as I can be with it. It's nothing that I can deal with for you, nothing anybody else can deal with for you. It's something that you need to deal with. So I'm going to let them sing and I'm not going to say another word. Let the Holy Spirit talk. Pray with me. Father, we come today and we just thank you and praise you. We give you all glory today. We ask you to continue to be with us all and continue to help us all, Father. We ask you to guide us and be with us today and be with us this week. Be with our play tonight, Father, and just help us to glorify you in all that we do today. Father, we thank you for your deliverance. We thank you for the gift of salvation. Go with us, go before us, and prepare our paths. And we just give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen.